Or the assessment.
will do so. Yeah. Okay. Just the top part. <coughs> in your binder. We'll talk about it at the end. So for our class, I'll have the stuff from the website, and you'll need to watch the class recording.
I think it says number 13, but it is 12. Sure. It's 12, but I think the assignment, like, it, like it's number 13 for some reason. Is that the right one? That's what I'm looking at, yeah. I don't see any of your work on this page. Oh. Okay. You should have some work for some of those. That's what I was talking about.
Okay. I think we still have a couple people working and that is fine if you are feel free to keep going a little bit longer um, but as you finish come turn it into the basket up here please for the rest of us let's go ahead and start moving on those of you that are still finishing up your test um, you can pull up the class recording to get this information later that way you're not missing out on anything Okay, so one of the handouts y'all picked up when you came in today was a <coughs> test reflection. 
So this should be number 14. And the reason why I have you put this in your binder is we do not let you keep the major assessments. So this quiz that you just took, you will not get this back for your binder. You are welcome to come and see it during advisory. You're welcome to check out your grade on grade book. Uh, but the only thing is to come see it during advisory, you have to wait until they have all been made up. So we've got a couple people that should be in today during advisory to make it up. Um, but we had at least one person today in your class, Aiden, uh, who missed it. So hopefully he'll make it up soon and then you can come and look at it whenever you'd like to. Okay, um, those of you that had me for pre-calculus, you know that I've had you do these test reflections in the past, and these are just completely for you. I won't take these up. You're not going to be judged. I'm not going to look at it and say, oh, you only studied 30 minutes. I'm going to let your parents know. It's nothing like that. But I will say that, in my opinion, it's much more important than the test reflections you did in pre-calculus. Because after you just took this, you do have some idea of what question types you should have practiced more, was there a definition you should have studied? All that stuff is fresh in your mind right now. And it's not going to be fresh in your mind in March slash April when we start reviewing for the AP exam. So that one section in the middle of the test reflection about something like what would you put on a note card or something like that, you really should answer that with fidelity. I really think that will help you at the end of the year get a jump start. Um, and Limits is one of the things that students feel like they need to review the most right before the AP exam. And the reason that is, is uh, all these limit questions, again, they're kind of skill-based. You know, here's a question type, practice doing it. Here's a different question type, practice doing it. Here's another question type, practice doing it. And most of that stuff doesn't carry on throughout the rest of the semester, which can be good or bad. Some people don't like limits. Some people think limits are difficult. Um, so the good news is that that doesn't dictate your success the rest of the semester. However, now that we are going to start talking about derivatives in a minute, most, at least 90% of the rest of the semester is about derivatives. It's going to be about taking derivatives by hand. There's a few ways to do that. Uh, memorizing some derivatives, knowing how to get our calculator to do some derivatives, and then we'll talk about applications and what derivatives have to do with the real world. So, obviously I hope that you feel good about limits, I hope that you feel like that is a skill you've got under your belt, but um, again, it does not really carry over. So, um, any just general questions about the test or anything like that? Okay, I should have your grades in the grade book. Um, I've got a, like just a couple in right now, but I should have the rest in by today. But again, you do have to wait until they're all made up to come by and see it. So if it's going to bug you, you thought you aced it and then you didn't get 100, if that's going to bug you, you might uh, postpone looking that up. But. Okay, so the other handouts you should have picked up is number 15, where we're going to talk about the definition of a derivative. So again, this is super important because this is going to help you with your understanding the rest of the semester. And honestly, kind of next semester too, because the other two parts of calculus, I told you on the first day of school, is uh, calculus is really three big topics. Calculus is either limits, which were checked off, we are done with limits now, other than the few times they show up in definitions, derivatives and integration. Integration is really just the inverse of derivatives. You're just undoing derivatives. So just like you learned multiplication and then you undid it with division. You learned adding, and then you learned to undo it with subtraction. So the rest of our course is going to be derivatives slash undoing it with integration. So this idea of a derivative is going to stick with us the rest of the year. So the better we understand what it is and where it comes from from this, the better shape we'll be in. Okay, so let's go ahead and start these. I don't know that we'll have time to finish all this assignment 15, but that's okay. Let's go ahead and I think I may not have numbered this one, so if I didn't, please number this 15. And of course, if you don't have your binder put together, now is the time to do so. We've only got 15 items, so it shouldn't take you more than a couple minutes during advisory to get it caught back up. Don't wait till you've got 40, 
things in your binder do. So when are we going to get 11 through 13 back? Uh, you can pick those up after class. Uh, They're in the basket over there. So. Okay, so before I tell you what a derivative is and why we need to know it, <coughs> we can just kind of stumble upon this if we talk about some stuff that we already know. So if I wanted to know the slope of either one of these equations, both of these are linear lines. Linear lines are what you guys tend to say are like straight lines. No curvature to them. Well, if it's in y equals mx plus b format like this, then the slope is 3. When it's written like this, do you guys remember what this format's called? Uh, point slope. Very good. And unless you are sure you know point slope, make sure you add this to your notes here because we do a lot of point slope in calculus. Point slope is actually easier than slope intercept. You should plug in the slope for m and plug in any point on the graph for x1, y1. We'll even be using that here in just a minute. But the point is, if it's in point slope, the idea is you should just be able to glance at that and see that the slope is 3. Now, this has never been a problem because when you have talked about slope in the past, you've only talked about slope as far as linear lines where the slope is always 3. If the slope is 3 at the beginning, the slope is 3 at the end. The slope is 3, the slope is 3. So in calculus, our second big problem, our first big problem that we dealt with was the 0 over 0. But in calculus, the second big problem is what if I want to know the slope of y equals x squared? Go up? Yeah, I, I was finish writing that down. Oh, go, okay, yeah. All right, there you go. Okay. So, what is the slope of x squared? It's not so easy, right? It depends. It depends on what x value you're looking at. If you took an x value at like 2, the slope would be something positive. It's actually 4. If you took the slope at negative 2, what do you think the slope there would be? Very good, since it's the, the other side. But main thing is it's something negative. What about at x equals 0? What do you think the slope there is? Very good. But the point is it changes. It depends upon the x value. It's going to vary. You're going to have an x in your slope. So for the first time, and you need this to stick as soon as possible, slope and derivative basically mean the same thing. Slope tends to imply you're talking about linear functions, whereas derivatives are more general. It can be any function. But when we're talking about the slope of this, we really want to know the derivative of it. Now, before I tell you where the definition of a derivative comes from and use it once, I'm going to show you that you actually already know the background um, to where this comes from. So let's say I would like to take the slope right here. I want to know the slope at that instant. Well, what we can do is we can say, let's take this point and let's take another point, I don't know, somewhere to the right. And I can find the slope of this gray line with these two points using our regular old slope formula. Subtract the y's to get the rise and subtract the x's to get the run. But now I don't know these and I want to keep them as general as possible. So for this point, I'm going to call him x, y or x, f of x. And how much I'm scooting from one point to the next we call the distance h. So this point would be at x plus h wherever this one is plus h and his y value comes from plugging in x plus h into the function. Now if I take these two generic points could, which could represent anything throw them into the slope formula you get y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 you can see the plus x minus x cancels out 
and you have something called the difference quotient. Those of you that did pre-calculus last year, you practiced simplifying the difference quotient for a few different question types. So we almost have the definition of a derivative. But the last thing we need, and it's a hint to what we did the first couple weeks of school here, this h value, if I really just want to know the slope at this instant, what do I, what value would I want h to be? Uh, as it approaches from the left. As it approaches what? The limit. Okay, the limit Zero. as h approaches what? X. Very good. We want this distance to be as close to zero as possible. The closer I can get this second point to the first point, the closer the slope formula is giving me the slope at that instant. Now, I can't just say plug in zero for h because we get undefined. So what we can do in calculus is we can say, take the limit as h approaches zero. So I can't plug in zero for h, but our roundabout way of doing that is say, well, I want h to be as close to zero as possible. And to be honest, this is why you have to start off with limits. You have to have some idea of what this means, what this represents um, before the definition of a derivative comes into play. So that's why we do limits first. Now, I already have this typed up for you um, over to the side, and I'll go back over there. But again, it's really just a slope formula for generic two points, and we want that second point to be as close to the first point as possible. So we want the limit as h approaches zero. Okay, so here we go. Here's the definition of the derivative, which I wrote out for you over there. And you don't have to worry about memorizing it between now and Thursday. Oh, I'll see you guys on Friday too. This first Friday of the year, that'll be a B day. But you will have to memorize this, and I'll show you on the next page how your AP exam expects you to do this. But this represents the derivative. Now notice this notation over here, f of x, would mean we're talking about the function f. But if there's a little tick mark here, this is called a prime mark. f prime means the derivative of f. So that one little tick mark completely changes what we're saying it represents. f is like a function, f prime is like a formula for the slope of that function. So kind of here's the same type of picture that I showed. So if you were talking about the slope at the instant of x here, so a lot of times we draw in what's called a tangent line. A tangent line is a line that touches your circle or your function or something at one place. Just out of curiosity, does anyone remember what type of line it is if it intersects in two places? Like this. This gray line, oops. This gray line was not a tangent line, it's got a different name. It's called a secant line. Doesn't sound familiar? No. Okay, that's fine. You don't need to worry about that right now. I was just curious if y'all had heard that before. Okay, so the next three questions, we're going to be doing basically the same work. And what I'm wanting you to try to figure out in your head here is paying attention to the directions. On one question, we're going to find the derivative slash find the slope. The next question is we're going to find the slope of the tangent line. And then the fifth question, we're going to find the equation, the equation of the tangent line. But we're talking about the same function, and so the work's all basically going to be the same. So I'm trying to get you to see that very, very similar work, slight direction changes, changes what your answer should look like. Okay, so this will be the only time this year that we will take this derivative by the definition. After this handout, uh, I'm going to show you some shortcuts. And the reason why we can always lean on, lean on the shortcuts is for whatever reason, your AP exam does not expect you to use the definition of a derivative to find the derivative. Um, in college, I had a professor who did do that. 
she told us every test would have um, find the derivative by the definition and she sure enough did that so anyway so the definition says take f of x plus h which it means take the function and everywhere there's an x you plug in an x plus h and then it says subtract the whole function I'm gonna go ahead and distribute that negative right away put the whole thing over h and we want that second point to be as close to the first point as possible so as h approaches zero now this part again might be familiar to those of you that did pre-cal last year because just this part without the limit is called the difference quotient and we did make you practice simplifying these so the rest of this is algebra we could square this which would be foil don't just square the x and square the h you could distribute the four or negative four I already distributed that negative and lots and lots of this stuff should cancel out and go to zero like plus three minus three plus four x minus four x plus two x minus two x everything should cancel out bless you except for a couple of things and there was something that all of these things had in common that were left over what is two xh h squared and minus 4h all have in common they all contain h okay so we can factor out an h like a gcf and then you can cancel which now this should sound familiar this is how we did limit questions you could have started with direct substitution up here if you wanted to but you'd get zero over zero we rewrote it rewrote it got something to cancel and now that something cancels what should we do we solve it Okay, what do you mean solve? We, we solve the things inside of parentheses. Okay, so what do you think the answer should be? Uh, 2x plus 0, I mean 2x minus 4. Okay, very good. So you should try to plug this back in. h goes to 0, so we get 2x minus 4. So that might not seem satisfactory because you're used to saying slope is a number, whereas derivative slash so slope can have x's in it but what you need to understand is that the derivative is like a formula for slope if I want to know when x is 0 what is the slope at that time you just plug 0 into the derivative and you know the slope at that time is uh, negative 4 if you know want to know what's the slope when x is 10 you just plug 10 into the derivative and you can see that the slope at that time is 16. Okay, you'll have to trust me on this one from before, but the derivative of x squared is just 2x. So when x was 0, the slope should be 0, just what we said. When, oops, when x is 2, the slope should be 4, just like I showed you. You can see it was positive, but I told you it was 4. If you want to know the slope when x is negative 2, you just plug negative 2 into the derivative, you get negative 4. Same thing. So derivative is like a formula that will tell you the slope of that function for any given x value. So now that we have that done, we can use this for question 4. Now question 4 just wants to know what's the slope of the tangent line. Well, remember the tangent line is like kind of a visual of what that slope is at that instant. So I would like to know what is the slope when x equals 1. And again, we try to wing ourselves off of saying slope all the time. I'm going to say slope a lot at first just to help make that connection. But what we really mean is derivative. Derivative and slope, same thing. What's the derivative when x equals 1? So I can just plug 1 into the derivative. And for that function, I can tell you that when x is 1, at that instant, it has a slope of negative 2. So again, the answer to 3 versus the answer to 4. Using the same stuff, but our answer they're asking for different things. Our answer should look different. 
Okay, and then last part, and then Wait, I'll... Is the X, like, supposed to look smaller, or are you emphasizing this? Y? Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying, I'm taking the derivative when X is 1. Okay, and then finally, we could also use this same stuff to answer what's the equation of the tangent line. Well, we can do point slope. The tangent line is always a linear line. When x equals 1, I know I plug in 1 for x1. But what about these two parts? These two parts are the key to being able to do this question. What is the slope of y equals x squared minus 4x plus 3 at x equals 1. Very good. That's what the derivative tells you. The derivative tells you the slope. Okay, what about the y value? This is supposed to be the easy part. If you know an x value of a function and you want to go find out where it is on the graph so you could plot a point, how do you go about finding the y value of that point? Pl plug in x to what though? Very good. So if you plug x into the original, that's great for finding points. If you plug x into the derivative, is that, uh, if you plug x into the derivative, you get the slope. So plug in an x value into the original function if you need a point plug the x value into the derivative if you want the slope. You need to make sure that you know which one goes into which. Two different things. And in a couple of weeks we'll talk about second derivative <coughs> and then sometimes plugging stuff into the second derivative gives you even more information. Okay, so the main thing I wanted to point out to you here is just the format of these answers. Three different answers, all about the same function. These two were both about the same x value. But finding the derivative could be look like one thing. The derivative at a point should be a number. And then if you want the equation of the tangent line, you should be using the derivative at that point and find the rest of the point uh, with the equation. So the next thing I'd like to do is I want to give you a visual of this. I know I had that printed out for you. But if I went to my calculator and graphed Okay, so here was the y equals in those three questions. And then we just found the, the last question, we found the equation of the tangent line at x equals one. So that means that if we found it correctly, it should touch at x equals one only, and it should look just like this. It should just barely skim by, touch there, and not touch anywhere else. So if I go ahead and graph that also, was that negative 2x plus 2? Was that right? Okay. If I graph that also, you can see that it did exactly what I was trying to do. It's a tangent line because it touches only once. It's at x equals 1 because that's the value I was plugging into. And it's got the right slope because I did the derivative correctly. So that's what it should look like. So sometimes you can do that um, as a quick little check. Okay, now here's how it's going to show up um, the definition on the AP exam and I will have you practice this some before the test and this will be one of those skills that we don't get to practice throughout the year so we'll have to practice it again before your AP exam. But they don't expect you to find a derivative by the definition like I did in question three. It's not that it's that difficult. But it does, it does depend on what question type it is. Polynomials are probably the easiest to apply that to. So, But what they will expect you to do, and so I will expect you to do the same thing before our next test, you will have to memorize the definition of a derivative. I showed you where this came from on the first page. 
and there's an alternate form which also just looks like the slope formula. So you'll have to memorize those two well enough that you can do process of elimination in multiple choice like the questions down below. So notice with this, this is always the limit as h approaches 0. This is minus the function here. This is the function with x plus h plugged in. Whereas down here, a is what you're trying to find the derivative of. So a will be here and here. And then over in the top left is the function. The top right is the function with that number plugged in. And so there's lots of hints based on these two forms. So looking at this question number one, does this look more like the standard definition or does it look more like the alternate definition? The alternate. Okay, so you got to make that connection first and then we're going to use this to get some hints. So once I've identified this as the alternate version, I know right here is supposed to be f of x. So it looks like the function they're taking the derivative of is natural log of x. And that already narrows it down to 50-50. Can't be choice A, can't be choice D. Only B and C say that the function is natural log of x. Okay, if A represents the value you're trying to find the derivative at, what is A in this question? Uh, X. E, e. Uh -huh. it's the number here. So I know that they are trying to find the derivative of the natural log of X at E. Uh, so that would be choice C. So again, I just match it up to which one of the two forms it looked most like. And then based on how that's supposed to be structured, it gave me a hint about what the function was, and it gave me a hint about what I wanted the derivative to be at. So let me do that again. Okay, question eight. So again, I would need to think about which one this looks most like. And that gets a little bit easier once you memorize the two. But the fact that this says the limit as h approaches 0 is my hint that this is going to be the standard definition. So in my head, I'm usually thinking of it like this. And I'm hoping to get clues by matching these things up. So this is supposed to be f of x plus h. So if I took out the plus h, it looks like f of x is the square root of 9. So what's happening here is they're already plugging in a value. So the function is actually probably the square root of x. But we're taking the derivative at 9, which is why they're plugging 9 in for x. Sometimes they plug in the numbers. Sometimes they don't. It just depends. Um, so I'd have to make sure that this makes sense with this. This is supposed to be the function. So if I think the function is square root of x, they could have either listed the square root of x there or they could have listed the square root of x at the value you want the derivative of. And that makes sense. The square root of 9 would be 3. So I go through all these choices. And if you can figure out that 9 was the value, then you're picking between a and c. But if you could figure out that the function was the square root of x, then that was the only one that made sense anyway. So again, there's not like a hard and fast rule where you do this, do this, do this. You just kind of have to match them up and think about what parts make sense, what parts don't make sense. OK, so on this one, I do want you to try this one on your own first. But look at our choices here. Do these choices look more like the standard definition or the alternative definition? Oh, the alternative. Very good, because the standard is always h approaches 0. So if it helps, maybe copy the alternate form down. And then I want you to try to answer that question. So read the question at the top, and then see if you can narrow it down to one choice. Which one has to? match up for what they're asking.
Okay, anybody got a guess which one you think it is? B. B? Okay, I don't know. Let's see. Um, so I do know that the function in this form is supposed to be in the top left, and they told me what the function is supposed to be. So that means you should not have picked A or C, because those were not set up correctly, but B and D both had this how they asked it to be. Okay, um, A in this question I can see is pi, but pi, 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 that's consistent with those. And so then F of A, this would be the function with A plugged into it. So the function with A, A is the number you're trying to find the derivative of. And what is the cosine at pi? Okay, so they can either put cosine of pi or they could put negative one. It just depends on the question. Those are the same thing. Uh, but this time it looks like they left it cosine of pi. So you should have been trying to aim for D. Again, you're gonna practice more of these in the future. I just wanna let you kind of narrow down a little bit about what the process should be. Okay, I think number 10 was probably the hardest of the four, but same thing. Let's make sure we're all looking at the correct form and then I'll give you a chance to try it out and see if you can figure out figure it out. Okay, so notice all of these say the limit as h approaches zero and they're all over h. To me that is not true of the alternate form, it's true of the standard form. So I guess you can glance back and forth at the top of the page, but I do think it might help if you write it right next to it too, so you can try to pair those things up. So I'll give you a minute to try that one. And again, I think it's probably the trickiest, but you can still give it a shot. Okay, so here's what's kind of tougher about this one, at least in my opinion. You know what the function is. You know this part's supposed to be the function with x plus h plugged in. So that looks like it could be c or d, because this is e to the x plus h, e to the x plus h. They're just plugging in x plus h in for x. But it actually could be a or b also. Because as I told you, sometimes they leave it x and sometimes they plug in the value that they want x to be. And they're saying they want you to find the derivative at e. So unfortunately, that doesn't narrow it down at all, or at least not yet. This is supposed to be subtract f of x. So if f of x is e to the x, that would be good if this was e to the x, or this, or this, or this. And since none of them are, what does that mean? It could be e to the e. Very good. So they're not plugging in x. They must be plugging in the actual value that they want it to be at. So that narrows it down to a or d. I'm sorry, b or c. It's not a or d. Okay. And then what do you think about b and c? To me, there stands out something. Uh, it would be b because it wouldn't make sense to plug in E for X for one of the X's, but not for the other. Perfect, yep. No sense in plugging in E for one of the X's 
and not the other, they're not going to do that. So you had to go with B. So again, it's kind of frustrating because sometimes they just plug in X's, sometimes they actually plug it in and get a number, and it just varies. But once you memorize those two and you practice a uh, process of elimination like that, then those will be uh, a little bit easier. Okay, let's just do a couple more minutes here. Again, it's going to be fine. We're not going to quite finish up this handout. We can start class on Thursday by finishing this up. But let's go ahead and do just a touch more. So we need to talk about when, just like limits cannot exist, derivatives cannot exist also. So at x equals 4, notice there's not a point there. And if it's not even a point there, how is there going to be a slope there? So I would say if it's not 1 or it does not exist, it's fine. What about at x equals 6? What would you say the slope at x equals 6 is? Zero looks like this. I would be, yeah, what is the Yeah, that doesn't make sense. It does not exist either. Neither of those two exist. So other than them two not existing, what else do they have in common that is calculus related? Okay, just continuity is fine. It is discontinuous. Very good. So it turns out that in order to be differentiable, differentiable is just a fancy word that means you could take its derivative. It, you can't take something's derivative at a point unless it is continuous at that point. So if there's a hole there, there can't be a slope there. If the graph is jumping there, then there can't be a slope there. Not at that instant, at least. There's a slope before it and a slope after it. So um, for the last two things we'll write in for this today, and then I'll share my next puzzle to share with you guys. Uh, but this one's just not super common. But when we start doing more FRQs, I have seen a handful of FRQs where in the directions they tell you that a function is differentiable, and there's a point or two assigned in that FRQ <coughs> For you saying that that means it's continuous. Just because a differentiable function is always going to be continuous, they expect you to say that sometimes. So my suggestion would be if you ever see that, just go ahead and put this down. I mean, I guess you can put it in. There we go. It's close enough. Uh, you can put it in words if you want to. But if you didn't need it for your FRQ, it took two seconds. And if you did need it for your FRQ, um, at least you would get those points. All right, and then the last thing, next. so this is the last thing. So there's a couple things you have to check to make sure that it is differentiable. But the one I want you to realize right now is it has to be continuous. And we know what that means now. To be continuous means there's a point there the limit that it approaches from the left is the same that it approaches from the right. And of course, the point has to equal the limit. So all three of those things are understood to be true if it is continuous. So again, I know we don't have much left there, uh, but we are down to about five minutes. So I do want to share with those of you interested. I would like you to spend a couple minutes and review the parts of 15 we did together before next class. But again, you don't need to finish this. We'll finish it together. OK, for today's puzzle, I don't I have a hard time keeping up. Did you, have you all done this one yet? Or seen this one? No. You have not seen this one. Okay. I would say this is one that my other classes had pretty good suggestions on. I, I know I've shown it to at least three classes, and I think they all had the same suggestion. So. Okay, if you brought one of my calculators, I need it back, please.
Guaranteed to die? Guaranteed to die, but you're guaranteed to die. Why? How's that going to help you? Because if he dies within 10 hours, then it's the first bottle. But if he dies after like 11 hours, then it's the second. Then 12 is the third. 13 is the That makes sense. Everybody agree with that? You just space him out by an hour and then based on when he dies. I guess it makes sense that the guy who poisons himself would know the answer to this. No, in your diet today, you probably consume about a gram of creatine per day. And then Why your body produces. Why would I like take extra then? In order to saturate the muscle more. Why do I need to do that? Because it increases cognitive ability and recovery time between sets and your blood weight and your. Why would I need to do any of that? To improve your performance and you know, like big so you can get the leads. Yeah, the, the, this this problem isn't accounting well, for the fact that I'm married, so it just be fine. Huh? This, this problem isn't accounting for the fact that I just drink the poison and take it. You'd rather just drink the poison than to figure just, it out. Just take it. If you die from it, that's a skill issue. Uh, same thing he said. Just give him all four bottles spaced out by an hour, and then based on when he dies, you knew which bottle it was. I don't know if that's the real answer. I haven't watched the solution video, but I mean that would work. It seems like it makes sense to me, but I'll share it to uh, Google Classroom. <laughs> I think so. If you had four rats, then just give them it all. That would be too easy. I think what you should probably do is just have them like taste a little bit and then wait to see him get sick. Take spin out Okay, but I'm just saying, like, why do you have to give him a bunch of it and kill him? Because he's a rat. He's your rat, though.